Hi, this is Dom Ciccone, and we're, we're at Amicus Briefs uh, with Kevin Prufer. A uh, few words about Kevin. He, most importantly, he was born in Cleveland, Ohio, um, and moved to Houston. Uh, he's received fellowships from National Endowment for the Arts. Uh, he's had the Lannan Foundation. He's a professor at Creative Writing. His newest poetry collection, The Fears, is coming from Copper Canyon Press. Uh, he has a novel coming out, Sleep Away. Uh, wonderful uh, books of poetry al already published from Four Way. Art of Fiction, Churches, uh, which I love, how he loved them in a beautiful country. Uh, he's edited several volumes. Uh, and he directs uh, the Unsung Master series, a book series devoted to bringing the work of great but little remembered authors. Kevin, welcome. Thanks. Uh, what are you uh, working on currently besides all of those things? <laughs> yeah, I'm, I've got those things coming out. It's sometimes hard to hard to begin a new project when something is in the wings, if you know what I mean. The, mm -hmm. sure. um, the poetry book is sort of imminent and the novel is almost, almost imminent. But, um, you know, I'm, I'm writing poems in the evenings. I don't know what they are yet. It, it seems like a, um, I've gotten real interested in storytelling in poems and I seem to be writing poems about terrible men. So, yeah, I, I remember you always had you always had a, a, a bent toward narrative. It was you, you struggle against it, but it, it it always comes out. Though I'm not looking forward to these. Thanks. Good. Okay. Are you ready? You run. Uh, what was your or is your favorite place to read a poem? Probably right here. You see, I've got this kind of nice little study up here on the second floor of my house in. Houston Heights, and there's a sofa back there. Um, I can only, I really only read poems at night. Um, I only write at night too. Um, if I'm reading a poem during the day, it's because it's work. It's because it's a poem by a student and I'm supposed to be critiquing it in a workshop or something like that. But I read them for pleasure at night, up here in the dark with a glass of something. Oh, interesting. What was the, what was the first poem you remember getting? Like, well, I get it, that kind of poem. I think it depends on what you mean by get. I remember in high school, we had to memorize a poem a week. Um, so we would get the poem, oh, I don't know, on a Monday. It was a boarding school. So I think it was on a Saturday that we had to sit down in this room and write the poem out. And um, we would get a, a grade off for every error that we made. And that included, you know, a missing comma or a missing semicolon. And I suspect, I don't know, but I suspect the idea was to make us understand the rules of grammar because nobody could memorize where every comma was in a poem. So you had to understand what a comma meant. I, I don't know that there was any high-minded, high you know, desire to teach us poetry at this kind of conservative little boarding school but every week the poem would get longer and longer um i remember having to memorize uh the love song of j alfred prufrock and thinking man this deep <laughs> i mean i don't i didn't understand the poem i don't think any high school kid really can absolutely understand that poem i definitely didn't know what it was about if you cornered me and said why do you like it or what what makes it great or what's going on in this poem I wouldn't have been able to say but it sure felt so profound to walk around campus reciting to myself let us go then you and I when the evening is spread out against the sky so I think that's a way of getting a poem I mean I think later in my life when I had to learn how to teach proof rock you know and give like a you know hour and 15 minute lecture on proof rock I think I lost some of what I really got as a high school student in that poem, you know, I I can certainly um, dissect it now, but I think I got it better at sixteen year old. You know. we, we hear the mermaids calling uh, at different times in our lives, I guess. Yeah, uh, they will. Either of us. Yeah. If 
if you could ask a, any question to a past writer or artist, who would that be and what would that question be? Well, I think I'm, I'm less interested in talking to writers and artists about their writing and art, because I think that their work is how they talk to us about their work. That is, Proofrock is talking to, Elliot is talking to us about Proofrock through Proofrock. And I'm afraid that to ask more about that would end up with explanations or with gossip. But I, I am interested in their lives. I, I would love to um, conjure up Suetonius or Procopius, you know, or two. Uh, um, classical historians, one of sort of the middle of Roman Empire and one of the beginnings of the uh, Byzantine. Um, not, not so much to talk about their writing, but to talk about their impressions of their time. I would love to be able to talk to them about their own time and what they thought of it. That, that would be really interesting. And it's funny that I'm picking two writers, two historians, but, but that would work with almost any smart person. Okay. But let's let's go to the to the contemporary. What what do you think contemporary writing gets right, and what do you think it misses? That's a big pro question. But yeah, you... that's a big question. I think, and I mean, I'm gonna maybe dance around it and sit and say that the writing and art of all times ultimately, I think, gets it right for their time. As in, there are always writers and artists describing their impressions of their time, explaining um, that to each other and to the not yet born. So in a way, I think it's sort of impossible to say that writers and artists would get something wrong as a group. You know, they might, they might overlook things or yeah, that, things. that's it. it's just things they miss not things they're doing wrong yeah but those aren't things they're doing wrong those are things that they're missing yeah and at the same time i know it's at the heart of the question which is that certain things get fashionable and when they get fashionable in art i often think that they're kind of in decline you know what i mean like when i start seeing everybody doing it i think i think the best of this has already probably been done and um but at least in my own writing or in the writing of my students, I'm always trying to encourage them to think outside of what's fashionable a little bit. I mean, right now, kind of suggested earlier, like um, very narrative poetry is extremely unfashionable, I think, in favor of a sort of um, deeply sort of personal examination of trauma or documentary poetics these are the things that are kind of on the rot are sort of fashionable right now which i think probably means we might be already moving past them but i'm always going to be more interested in the, 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 what, what some weird narrative poets are doing just just because i wonder if there's some excitement there that's happening in smaller communities that isn't happening you know on the vast social media and poetry land where interesting do you, do you read a lot of poems on social media or do you do you want them on paper I read them on social media. I mean, I, I don't go to social media to find poetry. I don't go to social media very much at, at all. But, you know, there's, there's a couple guys. There's a guy named Simon who I'm Facebook friends with. And every day he just posts a poem on Facebook that he likes. And I, I think he's got great taste. So I read those poems and I often come away thinking, yeah, Simon, that was a really good poem. I wouldn't have known about that one. And he reads real deeply. He reads way back into into the 19th century and, and, and before and read broadly. So it's not just the same old, same old. So yeah. Well, okay, speaking of libraries, if you had to divest yourself of all of the books in your libraries, except what would fit in one cardboard box, what's gonna be in your box? Would public libraries still exist? No, this is just yours. What what you're gonna put in your box? Yeah, oh, what you just gonna you just gonna put in your, some checkbooks and bills and go to the public library now? Well, I'm just thinking like are these, these books that I I want to have personally, or are these books I could never yes. see again if I got rid of them? Um, yes. 
it, it, yeah, it's not like it's the end of the world kind of thing. No. Okay, I was trying to decide, is, that, is this the apocalypse or is this like my, somebody steals all my books and leaves me just a box, which ones do I want? Um, I would want a good anthology of English language poetry, a good one. They always seem to get everything wrong after about 1970. I would want a good one. I don't know who, I, I can't, this is a fantasy because there is no good one. Like they're all crazy after 1970. So then they're, they're not bad up until about 1970. But I want that. And I want um, the complete Elizabeth Bishop, the complete Elliot, and the complete Keats. And then on the quirky side, my box is Russell Atkins' um, selected poems. It's called World Into Too Much. He's this really interesting African American experimental guy from the he started publishing in the 50s. Fascinating. And Laura Jensen. What there's no selective poems of Laura Jensen, but in my box there's a I'm imagining a selective of Laura Jensen to put it one day. And then and then the Roman classics. I want my Procopius and Suetonius and those are just the gossips of the age of Roman and okay. really good the period. I want the really good writers too like Seneca and Tacitus and Livy. That's my box. Yeah, your box is full. Good. What? Here's another yeah. uh, vague one. What makes th what makes anything art? Well, I think um, all art that I know of that I'm experienced with is deeply conventional ultimately conventional in that it makes use of the history and the conventions of the art in order to create the art, right? I mean, I think we often don't think about it that way. I think I grew up accustomed to thinking that people who would become, for instance, poets are unconventional people, but actually they're the most conventional people because they're the ones who are most involved in the conventions <laughs> Of the art of poetry to create more poetry. I mean, it's entirely conventional. So I would say it's uh, something is art when it makes an attempt using the formal conventions of the art form to communicate about ideas, feelings, and impressions, and stimulate thought and feeling in the person who partakes of that art, whether it is a peer or somebody who hasn't been born yet. I think I think that's it. I, th I like to think of art as a box of conventions, like, like um, you know, I mean, if you're thinking about it in terms of film, well, you know, this is this is how I think about it. Here's a good way to figure it out. My brother likes to call me up. He's a he was a DJ for a long time, and he's really into Bob Dylan. So he likes to call me up, and he'll read me Dylan lyrics over the phone, and then he'll say, hey, "Dude, man, you're a poet, so you you got to say this is poetry, right?" And I'll say, "Well." No, no, it's really not poetry. It, it's lyrics. And I'll say, oh man, you're just a snob. And I'll say, well, I, maybe, I don't know. But it seems to me that lyrics are different from poetry because the conventions are different, right? Like the conventions of one of the conventions of lyrics, the way he's thinking about Bob Dylan is that you have Bob Dylan singing them. You know what I mean? <laughs> or maybe Joni Mitchell sings them. But that's that's the convention of a song, which is different from the convention of a poem. Or it's like I, I would I always tell him it's like if you go into an art museum and you're looking at the greatest sculpture ever made, and you're judging it through the conventions of a painting, you're gonna fail to appreciate the sculpture, right? You're gonna be like, sure. you know, you only see it from one perspective, for instance. Same way with a painting, you'll walk around the back of the painting and say, oh, this painting sucks from behind. And you're like, well, no, you're judging it through the conventions of sculpture. So, you know, that's I mean, when I think like all, all of art is conventional and that something would be asking what makes something art, like the first place to go, I think is, is towards, towards history and convention, like history of how the conventions come to be and how the conventions change over time as a way of, and then ultimately I think art is a kind of communication. So it's, combination of communication and convention. Yeah, that was a bit, okay. Are you ready? Uh, if you could read a poem to your father, what poem would that be? And would you read it for us now? Um, I'm pouring myself a drink for this one. 
Sure. Um, my father is no longer with us. Um, so I was thinking about, you told me you were going to ask me this question, so I was thinking about it. I, I'm going to take the perverse path and read a poem to my father about his own demise, um, which he wouldn't know about until I told it to him. So I'm going to read I'm going to read a poem from Churches, called Churches. Is that all right? Whatever you like. All right. I know that sounds kind of perverse. Um, but in most of the stuff about him in this poem, I made up anyway. You know, I'm, I can never really write about true stuff. I always make stuff up, mostly, and slip a little bit of true stuff in, just, just, um, just where I need it. You know, it's 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 sort of, yeah, it's fiction salted with a little tiny bit of truth. Churches. In 1981, in a hotel gift shop outside Phoenix, Arizona, a little girl stood by the postcard rack, turning it gently. It creaked. She considered a picture of the desert, then looked around her for her mother, who was elsewhere. She gave the rack a firm push so it spun gently on its axle, smiled, pushed it again, and the postcard rack wobbled on spindly legs. And soon she had it spinning so quickly the cards made long blurry streaks in the rotation. Gasps of blue for sky, red for dirt, and then faster the girl slapping at it with her hand, grinning at me. And then a single postcard rose from the rack and spun in the air and landed at my feet, a picture of a yawning canyon. And then another, handfuls of postcards rising from the rack, turning in the air while the girl laughed and her oblivious mother at the other end of the store bought a map or a box of fudge, and then the air was full of pictures, all of them shouting, Phoenix, 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 twirling and falling until the empty postcard rack groaned once more, tipped and crashed through the window. There ought to be a word that suggests how we're balanced at the very tip of history and behind us, everything speeds irretrievably away. It's called impermanence, the little girl said looking at the mess of postcards on the floor. It's called transience, she said, gently touching the broken window. It's called dying, she said. It was 1981, and the clerk ran from behind the counter, stood before us. The girl smiled sweetly. The postcard rack glittered in the sun and broken glass. He turned to me, and my face grew hot. I couldn't help it. I was blushing. In 2009, my father lay in a hospital bed, gesturing sweepingly with his hands. What are you doing? I asked him. I'm building a church, he said. You're making a church, I said. Can't you see, he said. He seemed to be patting something in the air, sculpting something, a roof that floated above him. The hospital room was quiet and white. What kind of a church is it? I'm not finished. Is it a church you remember? God damn it, he said. Can't you see I'm busy? It was 1988 and I stood in line for my diploma and my father took a picture that I've lost now. 1984 and there we are around a campfire I can't remember. It was 2002 and his cells began to divide wrongly. First one deep in the wrist bone, then another turned hot and strange, deformed, humpback and fissured, queer and off kilter, one after the other though no one would know it for years. It's called dying, the little girl said, while the postcards suspended in the air like a thousand days. I reached out to touch one, then another, and all at once they fell to the floor. Then the clerk said I was paying for the window. Where were my parents and who was going to pay if I didn't know where my parents were? And the girl smiled from behind the keychains, and her mother pursed her lips at the far end of the store. The window had a hole in it through which a dry breeze came, and the postcards shifted on the floor. Years later, my father was still making that church with his hands. They do that, the night nurse said, patting his head like he was a little boy. He was concentrating on his church, though, his hands shaping first what seemed to be the apse and then fluttering gently down the transepts. He sighed heavily, 
frustrated, began again. Can I bring you anything else? The nurse asked. No, I said, thanks. Are you sure? She watched him tile the roof, watched his fingers shape another arch, and then it was much later and he'd fallen asleep. Outside, snow covered up the cars. It's called forgetting, the girl said, while the clerk watched me and I blushed until there's nothing left. And a breeze entered through a hole in the window. Then you're out of time, she said and shrugged. Some of the cards were face up on the floor, two burrows climbing a craggy slope, the Grand Canyon like a mouth carved into the earth, a night lit tower like a needle. And I was sweating now, but I couldn't speak. And then I was running from the shop, past the fountain and the check-in desk, down the tiled hall to the hotel pool, where my father lay on a plastic beach chair, reading a book about churches. Sunlight flecked his chest. His hair was wet from swimming. What's the trouble, he asked. First, his cells were thick and soupy, clotted and aghast, and then they were spinning through the air, and it was 1986 and rain drummed on the roof, or it was snowing years later in Cleveland, his hands working the air, while the nurse stood in the doorway and sighed. Wind and sun, a bright day, a lovely day to lie by the hotel pool and read about how men spent lifetimes building them and never saw them finished. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. That was wonderful. Thank you for being here with us. Uh, thank you for supporting poetry all over Houston for your wonderful work. Uh, good night. Thanks for doing this. Good night to you. Good night.